Good morning, everybody. So glad you're here with us today. I know that's already been said. I want to welcome everybody online watching via the internet through CultivateChurch.tv. So glad you're here with us today. Well, listen, we finish up a series this morning that we've called The Love Bomb. And all month long, we've just been encouraging our church and everybody involved with Cultivate, we've just been encouraging them just to drop a love bomb on somebody in their life throughout the week and just look for opportunities just to show random acts of kindness to people, just to love people around them. And you guys have just shown some incredible stories, some things that you've been able to do and some pretty, some pretty creative things you've been able to do just to love your family and people around you. And uh, all month long, we've been doing that, talking about that subject and that, uh, that concept. And just if this is maybe your first week with us, I'll review just real quickly maybe the bottom line of the first couple of weeks. Week one, we talked about the bottom line of that message was our life requires it requires, uh, it requires something of God's love from us, right? We need to know. We need, we need to live our life. It requires a response. God loves you so much, and he has a plan for your life. And the way we love our life should be in response to his love for us. And then week two, we talked about from the inside out and how if we're really going to do something great for God, we got to love ourselves first. We've got to love who he created us to be and know what he's designed for our lives. And that was week two. And then last week, we talked about tough love. Anybody ever had somebody hard to love in your life? Maybe they're just hard people to get along with, hard to love and hard to show love to. We talked about how to respond to those people just biblically and with the love of God. And then today we're going to be talking about our relationships. Now here's what I want you to do. It's going to, this can be a tough subject because some of you, as I'm speaking this morning, some of you are struggling in relationships. I know some of you are uh, struggling in your marriages and maybe, maybe you've got friendships that are disbanding and it can be a tough subject to talk about. But this morning I just want to hand it with just scripture and what God says about love in our relationships. So husbands and wives, maybe you just want to snuggle up against each other a little bit more today. And I don't want you, I don't want to see any elbows flying or pinching going on as we're talking, but we're just going to cover how we can just mend our relationships, how we can strengthen our relationships. And you know what? This is a great message, not just for married couples or not just for people that are dating or this is great. If you're single, this is great. If you've just got relationships in general, this, this principles, the principles that we're going to be talking about this morning are going to really be, they're universal. They can, you can use these principles whether you're in marriage, they work great. If you've just got a, a friendship that needs to be re- restored or needs to be strengthened, man, that can work great because it's the principle of love. Everybody say love. One, two, three. It's the principle of love and it works no matter what we're doing. We've titled our message this morning, Facebook Official. Facebook official. That's a new term to me, and apparently it is the new term for relationships. Used to it was we were dating, or used to it we we were just friends, but apparently you're not friends anymore. You're not really friends unless you're friends on Facebook. You're not friends, or you're not even dating unless it's Facebook official. If you don't put it on Facebook that you're not single, that you're dating this specific person, it doesn't count. I've even seen people sometimes, they just say, I'm married. And I'm like, well, who are you married to? And everybody asks that question. Are you embarrassed by your spouse? Why don't you put who you're married to? It's, it all really counts. So Facebook official is the, time, is the uh, concept we're going to be talking about today. And when I was walking through the message this week, I heard a joke that I'll share with you, a story about a man walking down the street. And he heard a voice tell him, he said, stop. If you go another step, a rock is going to fall and it's going to hit you in the head and it will kill you. So the man stopped and sure enough, a rock fell out of the sky and it fell right in front of him. And he thought that was kind of crazy. So he just, you know, kept walking down the walk path. And the the guy, the voice came back again and he said, stop. He said, if you take another step, a car is going to come around the curve and it's going to kill you. And he stopped and sure enough, a car came speeding around the curve and it just barely missed him and swiped by him. And the guy said, who are you? What is your name? Where are you at? And the guy said, well, I'm your guardian angel. I'm here to protect you. And the guy said, he said, well, oh, yeah? He said, where were you when I got married last week? Because some of us, some of us take our relationships that way. Some of us are in times where we go, I don't, I wish I hadn't done this. Some of you have relationships when you go, I don't know how in the world we have been friends all of this time, or how did we get married and, and have lived this time together? Some of us, our relationships just are struggling. And I want to talk on that concept this morning. You know, I want to tell you some uh, statistics. The average relationship I found out this past week only lasts no longer than seven years. The average friendship, just buddies, friendships, lasts no more than seven years in the United States. And even with that, the average marriage, the average first-time marriage in the United States lasts no longer than eight years. 
That's one in every five marriages that are, are failing within eight years. Now, if you increase that statistic to one in 12, one in every 12 marriages are ending in the first 24 months of marriage. Why? Because we don't know how to handle our relationships. We don't know how to live a life in relationships with other people and we struggle with our relationship with God and we struggle with our relationships with other people. And I believe it's this principle. I believe it's because we really don't understand what love really is all about. See, a lot of people think love is a feeling. You ever heard the term, I'm in love, I fell in love. And maybe you've even said this term before, I'm not in love with you anymore. I don't think I love you. I just don't feel it anymore. Well, the problem with that is, is you're talking about your feelings and love has zero to do with your feelings. So I want to talk about a term this morning that we're going to kind of carry throughout our message is this. Love is not a feeling that you can fall in of or out of. Love is a decision you make. Love is an action you take. It has nothing to do with your feelings. See, we follow our decisions and our feelings will follow our decisions. But if we follow our feelings and let our decisions follow our feelings, we will always, always make the wrong decision. You'll always make the wrong choice. When you let your decisions curve your life, when you let your decision, I mean, your, uh, your feelings drive your life and drive every decision you make all because you feel it, that's what leads to a wrong decision. You know, the Bible says in Jeremiah that your heart is deceitful above all things. It says, who can know it? The Bible says that you can't trust your feelings, your heart, your emotions, because they will always lead you down a wrong track. The Bible says that we need to know what Scripture says, and we need to follow those decisions and know if it's in God's Word, then we need to to follow that, whether we feel like it or not, and know that our feelings will eventually follow those decisions. So here's why you need to listen to this message this morning, because as I've been talking, people have popped in your mind, probably everybody in here. As I've been speaking to you this morning, there's somebody that's in your head that you go, man, I've really, I really messed up that relationship. Or man, that guy's a jerk. I don't know how we're friends. That's exactly who you're talking about today. I don't know. You've thought of somebody in your mind that maybe a relationship is struggling, or maybe you've got someone in your life you would like to strengthen that relationship with. So here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to pray, and we're going to read a, a verse of scripture. I've, I've highlighted it in your notes. There wasn't any room to put the whole, per, whole passage, but it's 1 Corinthians 13, and we're just going to go through eight verses, and then we're going to break those down and find out what God says about our relationships and love in those. So let's just pray together. Father, we love you. We honor you today, God, because you're good. God, because you have a perfect plan for our life, that we don't have to live life on our own, but God, we can live our life on purpose, making decisions that you've laid out for us in your word. God, it's eternal, and it works uh, as well today as it did a 1,000 years ago, as it did uh, 500 years ago. God, your word still stands strong. And I pray today that we open our minds and our hearts and we, expect, we, uh, we, we, we invite your word in our hearts and God, we make decisions based on what your word says and how you guide our lives. We'll honor you for everything you do in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's read together. You can look on the screens. It starts with verse one in chapter 13. It says, I, if I speak in tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And I love the part of verse 8, the first part. It says, love never. Everybody say never. Come on, one more time. One, two, three. Love never fails. Love never fails. Now, a lot of us can say, well, you know what? Love just didn't work for my family. Love just didn't work for this particular relationship. Here's the problem. It wasn't love because love never fails. You were trying something other than love. You had a misinterpretation of what love really is because love never fails. So I just want to lay out. This is going to be very practical. It's going to be very self-centered. What we're reading here is what we're going to talk about this morning. It's going to be very easy for you to grab hold of, okay? 
okay? We're gonna lay out the principles in these eight verses and we're gonna talk about what that means in our relationship. So you, know, you talk, we've talked about Facebook. There's two terms you can get when somebody wants to be a friend with you. You can either confirm those friends or you can ignore those friends. Anybody ignored some friends? You are not gonna be on my Facebook, right? We've ignored some friends. So I wanna talk to you about three people, three friends you need to ignore in your relationships. Number one is the smooth talking friend. The smooth talking friend. 1 Corinthians 13, verse one, that's what it talks about. It says, listen, if I speak in tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. What does that mean? What's he talking about? You can speak with the most etiquette and you can be the best talker and the smoothest uh, communicator of on the earth and really say nothing. Anybody seen people, you know people like that in your life? They're just the best talkers. They know how to articulate and they know grammar really great and really well and they can just talk really well, but nothing seems to work. Those people, the Bible says, if I only speak like that, but I have not love, I am a clanging symbol. Listen to what Proverbs 26 talks about it. He says, smooth words may hide a wicked heart, just as a pretty glaze covers a clay pot. People may cover their hatred with pleasant words, but they're deceiving you. They pretend to be kind, but don't believe them. Their hearts are full of many evils. While their hatred may be concealed, trickery by trickery, their wrongdoing will be exposed in public. So this is the friend who always talks the talk. They've always got something good to say or they've always, uh, they've always got words to talk about, but they never seem to follow through with those words or they never seem to follow through with action. Now, these are the people that always say, but I love you. Right? You ever heard those people? I, I just love you. And they say it a lot, but they don't really express it a lot. There's nothing that really comes from the words. It's just a lot of talk. Those are the smooth talkers. We need to ignore those friends. And number two on our list of people that we need to ignore is the know-it-all friend. The know-it-all friend. These are people that we just don't, we don't need to deal with. The know-it-all. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 13. It says, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. My wife would say that's me sometimes. I probably act like that. And most of the time in this category, it's most of the guys that are the know-it-all. Wives can probably thank me later, but it's your husband that always thinks he knows everything. We think that way. I think that time a a good bit. It's the know-it-all, but listen to what that is. That is a prideful attitude. The know-it-all is just a prideful attitude. You're the person that nobody can seem to get along with. You've got an answer for everything. You've always got it figured out, and it's an argument with somebody all the time because whatever answer you give is the correct answer, and whatever answer anybody else gives is the wrong answer, no matter what. It's that prideful attitude. I know everything. And listen to what Proverbs 11 tells us about that. It says that pride leads to disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. You know this, there's a huge difference between knowledge and wisdom. People think, oh, I have to know all of the answers. That means I'm wise or that means I've got wisdom. But that doesn't mean that at all. Wisdom, knowledge says, I know the answer. You're wrong, I'm right. Wisdom says this, I may not know the answer, but let's ask the right people. There's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. And it says that with pride comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. They're always got the answer. You need to stay away from the know-it-all. And maybe you are the know-it-all and you need to realize that. And you need to go, all right, maybe I don't know everything. Maybe I'm gonna work that part out in my own life. And number three, the third thing, that we need to stay away from is the shallow friend. The shallow friend. Now, chances are every single one of us knows somebody right now with all three of these people that that meet all three of these criteria at some point in our life. The shallow friend says this in 1 Corinthians 13, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, and I underline that in your notes, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Now, why do you think he put that in there, that I give everything away, that I can boast in it? You know, Jesus spoke to that in Matthew chapter six. He says this, uh, verse two, he says, when you give to someone in need, don't do so as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward that they will ever get. It's the shallow friend. This is the friend that maybe doesn't mind doing something for you, but they're always gonna ask for something in return. 
I'll, I'll do this for you, but you're going to owe me a favor later. I'll, I'll come, you're out of gas on the side of the road. I'll come fill you up, but you owe me. It's always, always they, they always seem to cover up. It's shallow. They do things, but it's always in return for something. It's never out of love. It's never out of the kindness, really, of their heart. It's this shallow attitude that they have about their relationships and the people, that people just owe them, and everybody owes them. Even in their relationship, you just owe me. I'll love you, but I'll do this for you, but you owe me. That's the shallow friend. We need to stay away from from those people. And I want to spend the rest of our time because that's kind of the problem section of our relationships. All of us kind of fall into one of those three categories generally in our lives. That's the kind of friend we are to people most of the time when we're not doing it right. We're typically the know-it-all or we're the shallow friend or or we're the uh, the smooth talker. We try to do that. And that's how we try to mend our relationships too. If you've done something wrong, you're going to, but you're, you're going to smooth talk your way in there. You're going to try to find the answer or you're going to do something for that friend or for your spouse or for that person that you're in a relationship with to try to fix the problem, but that's not the answer because that's the opposite of what love is. So this morning, I want to talk to you about what scripture tells to us about love. So the current, you want to confirm these friends. You want to confirm these. Number one, they are patient and kind. They're patient and kind. It goes right along 1 Corinthians 4, the first part. It says, love is patient. Love is kind. Again, we talk about patience. Patience is a choice we make. Sometimes we justify our lack of patience. Maybe you've said this before. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry I blew up. But, anybody said that? I'm sorry I acted the way I did, but man, you just get on my nerves. I'm sorry I did that, but I can't believe you said that or did it that way. We justify our lack of impatience. We don't realize that the whole point of patience is the fact that somebody did get on our nerves or they did do something uh, against us, and it takes patience to overlook those things. So we shouldn't blow up. When we blow up and we do that, it's showing a lack of patience in our life. And then, then there's kindness. Love is patient and love is kind. You know, of all the things God did for us in this earth, the Bible talks about him being our healer, and it talks about him being our savior. It talks about him, uh, you know, there's stories in Scripture of him walking on water and splitting the Red Sea and doing some crazy miracles, he, making people that can't hear to hear. He does some crazy stuff throughout Scripture, but the Bible talks about what draws people. In Romans chapter 2, is Romans chapter 2 verse 4, it says, but it was his kindness that led, that led us to repentance. Of all the things that God could have done to show to us who he was, of all the things that he could have done to show us, to lead us to salvation in him, it was his kindness that drew us to him. Now, don't you think that your kindness is going to do the same thing to other people around you? Because it was God's kindness that led us to repentance, don't you think that a little kindness goes a lot, a lot farther than our attitude, that, than our uh, impatience than us being us trying to justify who we are but I'm right and you're wrong and that very well may be the case but it's still showing impatience it's still showing unkindness and the uh, I'll never forget the very first time I got my uh, first ticket now I've had many I've had a lot of tickets I'm not the best driver people close to me would uh, attest to that I'm not the very best driver on the planet Pastor Brandon Matthew says he doesn't know when he's going to die but he knows how he's going to die he's going to be in my car and I'm going to be driving <laughs> so I'm not the best driver but I remember getting my first ticket and I, I was working, I worked in high school, I was working for a, a baseball park and I was lining up all the fields because it was all stars and the next day was gonna be a big day so we were working really late getting all the fields ready and I was really just on my way home and I remember uh, on, driving on this back road coming from uh, the ballpark to my parents' house and I was probably going like 80 in a 40. I mean, I was moving but I really didn't pay attention to it. You know how you can get just zoned out and not pay attention but I remember zooming past and seeing the cop out of the corner of my eye and knowing that I am fixing to die. I'm fixing, life is over for me. He turns the lights on, he pulls me over and I give him the sob story. I'm scared to death. And I mean, you're shaking. The first time you ever get pulled over for a car, I mean, it was just a dramatic experience for me. And he gave me that ticket and I knew, I said, well, this is my death warrant. I'm done. I'll never live again. I'm just gonna show this to my parents and let them take it to the morgue. This is it. But I remember walking into my parents' house and for whatever reason, they were still up and I laid it on the table and I told my mom and dad, I said, I am so sorry. And you do whatever it takes. I'll do whatever it takes to pay. Please don't kill me. And I'll never forget the kindness that my parents showed me and the patience they showed me that night. They said, Brandon, it's okay. 
it's really not that big a deal. It happens. Now that you've done it, it's over with. Don't do it again. But we love you. It'll be taken care of. We'll, we'll help you. We'll work this thing out. The kindness that they showed me because I expected completely the opposite. Maybe you've done something in your marriage. Maybe you've messed up the finances at some point or another. Or maybe you didn't balance the checkbook correctly. Or you've done something wrong that upset your spouse. Or a friendship. You said the wrong thing and it just made them mad. And you just, you just expected the worst. You didn't want to tell them. But how crazy is it when you go to that situation and, and then instead of what you expect, you get the kindness out of that. You get patience out of that. It goes so much farther in the relationship when you have those opportunities. When you have an opportunity, justifiably so, to be angry. You have a right to be mad. You have a right to be upset, but you show kindness instead or you show patience instead of, instead of showing your anger. It, it blossoms your relationships. Number two, the thing, uh, thing that we need to confirm is, we need to, is, is our friends, they celebrate with you. They celebrate with you. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 and 4, it says, love does not envy. Love does not envy. Anyone ever know somebody, you had a friend or, or maybe your spouse or a relationship that, man, they couldn't celebrate with you no matter what happened. They're always, they've always got something else to say. They're, it's almost like a jealous spirit. You tell them you're, you're excited about something happening in your life or something good happened to you, and they say things like, well, I bet you couldn't do that again if you wanted to. They, they say things like, uh, they say things like, you know, or maybe they even do this. Maybe they don't uh, just talk negative about it, or maybe they're just not excited about it. They don't celebrate at all. They go, yeah, that's cool, whatever. Those those aren't, those aren't people. Those aren't real friends. The Bible says love doesn't envy. It doesn't have a jealous spirit. And the opposite of that is it celebrates you. It celebrates your victories. It celebrates the good things that happen in your life. A real friend in your life and your relationship, husbands, man, when something good happens to your wife, we should celebrate that thing. It may not matter so much to you, but it means the world to them, and we need to go overboard celebrating those good things that happen in, their, in your life. God does the same thing with us. He celebrates. The Bible says that he dances over us. He loves us and celebrates the good things that happen in our life. So we have the, the biggest problem we have in our relationships a lot of times is we like to critique the wrong without celebrating the good. We're always good to critique what we don't see right in our relationship. We always get upset when the clothes aren't folded just right or when the house isn't cleaned just right or we didn't do exactly the way we, we make sure we are good to point that out. I'm good at pointing things out that are wrong. I find things that are wrong really well and I've learned that I don't, I don't celebrate wins as well as probably I should and even studying for this message, it's convicted me. Brandon, you need to celebrate things more because you know the strongest marriages have the best friendships. You know that? The strong the strongest marriages in life have the best friendships. The strongest relationships, you're good friends. It's, it goes deeper than just saying we're buddies. It goes deeper than just saying we're friends. It is a legitimate friendship. You should celebrate those things. You don't need to be jealous of the victories or the good things that happen to your friends or to your spouse and in your relationship. You need to celebrate those things because that is love. That's what love is. Whether it means a lot to you or not, you celebrate it because that's love. Number three, a friend we need to confirm is they are humble. These friends are humble. Love does not boast. This is a big one because most of us, man, we're so prideful in our relationships. We're so prideful in our marriages and in our, with our friends. Proverbs 16 and 18 says this, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. A haughty spirit before, pride goes before kablooey, right? That's what happens. With, that's what it's saying. That's, uh, that's Brandon 101. Pride goes before boom. It's going to explode. Pride, go, pride goes before destruction. When you get prideful in your relationship, you better check up quick. You need to check your spirit quickly because when pride comes in, it says it goes before destruction, before everything dismantles. Many of you are in here right now and your relationships are struggling. Some of you are in here, maybe everything's done except the paperwork and it's all, all, everything's all but said and done. And I would just encourage you check your heart check your spirit check where you are in your relationship how prideful are you here's the pride test okay are you ready here's a pride test you can take when was the last time I apologized without a but when was the last time I just said I'm sorry you're right I was wrong when's the last time that happened see because here's what we typically do we typically apologize very pridefully I'm sorry 
But this is what happened. This is why, and we want to justify. It's like justifying our impatience. I'm sorry I did that, but this is what you did to make me do that, and you shouldn't do that. That upsets me. That irritates me. Maybe I went overboard. But, but man, that just gets on my nerves. And now all of a sudden, we're just being prideful again. The pride test is, can I apologize for something I know I did wrong? And just say that's it. Please forgive me. That's the pride test because real friends are humble. They're humble in our relationships. Number four, they are respectful and generous. They are respectful and and generous. There was a scripture, we're not going to read it, you don't have to put it up on the screen there, Kevin. Uh, I'm just going to kind of paraphrase it through for you. It's in uh, Matthew chapter 6, in verse 38, the scripture says, give and it will be given to you. And I'm just going to tell it about you. And it says, with good measure, pressed down, shaken together, overflowing in your lap, it will be given. That's what it talks about. And a lot of people talk about that scripture just being a given scripture. We think finances when we talk about that. But when you look into the context, maybe you can write that down, might write that verse, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 6. And to start with verse 27 and go home and read that in your, uh, in your off time. Because when you start at verse 27 and go to 38, we realize it's not talking about money at all. At all is it talking about money. It's talking about our attitude. It's talking about our relationships. It talks about judging and how we treat our enemies. It says, don't, it tells, it says things like, hey, when your enemy slaps you on the cheek, turn the other cheek and let them hit you back. It says things like, when they steal something from you, go ahead and let them have it. Let them have it. Don't ask for anything back. If somebody borrows something, give it to them. Now, many of you are sitting in this room right now and you're in a relationship where you've been done wrong. Maybe somebody did the wrong thing to you. Maybe they did something to you that hurt you, that was offensive to you. And really up until this point, you go, I'm not sure if I could even forgive that offense and that friendship. Because remember, our friendships, typically friendships just don't last very often because we follow our feelings. And you've got that feeling right now. But the Bible says that, uh, that it is love, that love is respectful and generous. You're respectful to that person and generous. What does that mean, generous? With your attitude. Man, you are very generous with the way you treat people, even when they do you wrong. There's been people in my life that have done me wrong so many times, but I've just learned to have a generous spirit with that relationship. I'm just generous. I give them, I just keep giving to them and giving to them and giving. And what I mean by that is I'm giving them love. I'm giving them patience. I'm, I'm just giving to the relationship. I'm trying my best to always make it work. And scripture is clear with that. It says, hey, as far as it is to you, try to live at peace with all men. Do your best to do the right thing. Be, for, uh, be, be generous be generous and be respectful in your relationships. Number five, number five, they, are, they forgive. They forgive. You need to confirm these friends. They forgive. Listen to what it says, 1 Corinthians 13 and 5. It's not easily angered. Love is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrong. Now, these are very practical, and you go, man, we're just reading through that scripture, but how many times have we literally taken these points, these principles to heart? They forgive. Another way of saying that is this. Love doesn't store up ammo. You forgive and you forget. It's probably true with you as it is with me. We, get, we have the shortest fuses with the people that are closest to us, right? I do. I tend to have the shortest fuse with the people that are closest to me, the friends that I'm closest to, my spouse, my wife, my friends. Why? And I've always justified it this way, but I can just be comfortable with you. I can just be who I am with you. But reality is this. If that's who you are, you need to check up. If all you have is a short fuse with those closest to you and you tend to blow up on them a lot and you irritate them a lot and you say, well, that's just who I really am. I can be open with you. Then you need to check your heart and you need to ask God to forgive you because that's a wrong attitude to have. Because man, truthful friends, it says love is not easily angered and it keeps no record of wrong. I mean, a good friend, they're not gonna be easily angered with you. They, can, they know who you are and they love you anyway. They know the way, they know the, uh, the life that you've lived and they love you anyway. That's who Jesus is to us. Friends, forgive. Number six, they're honest. They're honest. First Corinthians 13, it says, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. I love how it said it there because it talks about basically dishonesty just being evil. Love doesn't delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. And honesty is, man, the biggest key in a solid relationship. You can, if you want to have a strong relationship, man, you want to you have a solid friendship where you guys just grow in your relationship, be honest with each other. So many people are just dishonest in their relationships, and we justify that. It's just little things. Maybe you spent some money, and you just don't want to fight about it, so you just hide it. Maybe you put it on the credit card so you don't have to talk about it when it comes up because you know it's just going to be a fight when you spend over the budget, so you're dishonest about it. 
It just starts little bit, little bit, little bit. Little things here, little things there. It breeds dishonesty into your relationship. And reality is this. If you'll tell a story about that to your friend, you'll tell a story about something bigger to your friend. And it breeds dishonesty in your relationship. And a strong relationship breeds honesty. You know, we can't be dishonest with God. That's how come. You can't be dishonest. You can't lie to God because he knows everything. There's nothing we can do to hide from him. And, And that's why I think a lot of the times God knows us so well. And it breed and bring it just brings an honest relationship between us and him. And then number seven, number seven, the final one here is they always see the best in you. The people you need to confirm, they always see the best in you. I love this verse, 1 Corinthians 13 and 7. It says, It always protects love. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, and it always perseveres. You know, I love my wife more than, I th- more than anything on this earth. I love her. She is my very best friend and the closest companion I have. And of all the things she could do for me and all the things that makes me love her, it's one of these, one of these things that it says right here. It always protects, always trusts, and always hopes. You know, I love my wife. I'll never be found. My wife, I know I can trust. I'll, she will never be found not protecting me. She will always protect me. Somebody could say something bad about me or she could hear somebody saying something about me and she's gonna, she's gonna put on the gloves, man. It is on like Donkey Kong. She does not like people talking about her husband. She doesn't like people. She, pro- she protects me. She protects our relationship. She's that way with her friends. She protects them. She does not, she doesn't allow people to gossip about them, to say things about them, to do things against them. She is protecting over her family and over her friendships. And I would say to this, how, how, how long has it been since you've just been protective? Man, you've been mama bear over your family or you've been that way over your friends and your relationships. Or have you been found uh, maybe with the girls outside of, outside of your family, you're hanging out with the girls one night and you're just talking about your husband. You're talking bad about him. I can't believe he does that, or he does this, and he does that, and I don't like that. Well, that's not protecting your husband. Man, that's not, that's not doing that. That's not uh, trusting and bringing hope into your relationship. Husband's the same at work. You're talking about your wife, the way that works. Or maybe you've got a friend, and you just talk to your other friends about them. That's not, being, that's not seeing the best in them. You see, the greatest thing about God, of all the things that he could have done for you, the greatest thing that God does for you is he sees the best in you. He sees the best in you. He don't see you where you are today, the mistakes you made last week or the mistakes you've made living, uh, leading up to today. He doesn't look at that. He looks at the plan he has for your life and he sees the best in your life. He sees what you're gonna be. He sees the potential of the great things you could do in your life. He sees the best in you. Great relationships, man. The per- person you need to confirm in your life, the person you need to be is you need to be a protector. You need to trust and you need to hope in your relationships and it will always persevere. The Bible says love never fails. The greatest thing, in the last part of this chapter, it says, now these three, three things remain in uh, chapter 13. It says faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Here's what I want you to do. Just everybody in this room, just bow your head and close your eyes. There's a lot of information, but it's very practical for your relationships, guys. How do I strengthen my relationship? Man, I'm, I lose my pride. I start being protecting over my relationship. I start laying down myself and putting them first. I start loving them. I'm honest. I see the best in them. Maybe you're here this morning, and man, your relationships have just been struggling. Reality is this. You've, you've followed your feelings your whole life. You followed your feelings your whole life. Every relationship you've been in of and out of has been all about your feelings. It's been all about what you feel. And when you felt like it wasn't gonna work, you just ran from it. Not only has that happened in your marriages or happened in your uh, dating relationships, but it's happened just in your friendships. Whenever you just felt like it wasn't gonna work, they did something against you, you ran from that. The reason is because you don't really know what love is. The Bible says that God sees the best in you. And he wants relationship with you. The Bible says that he loved you so much and he saw so much potential in who you could be and the plan he created for your life that he sent his only son to die on a cross that he, that he could take away every sin you've ever committed in your life. He could take away every bad decision you've ever made in your whole life. And the Bible says that he throws that as far as the east is from the west and he'll never bring that up again. He's a forgiver. And maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Brandon, that's me. Man, I wanna give my heart to Jesus. 
I want that relationship to be mended first. I want that relationship to be strengthened first. My relationship with God has struggled. Or, or maybe you're here and you say, I've never even had a real relationship with Jesus. And if you say he sees the best in me and he forgives me and he'll never bring it back up again and I can start with a clean slate today, I'm ready to give that a shot. We're not gonna embarrass anybody. I just want you to slip your hand up and slip it right back down. We're not gonna call you to the front. I just wanna pray with you. Today, this is me. I just wanna give my heart to Jesus. If that's you, just slip your hand up right where you are. Come on, if that's you online, you're watching through the, through the internet, just go ahead and make that decision and tell somebody about that. Email us here at the church and let us know what God's doing in your life. And then maybe you're here this morning and you say, but man, I've got a relationship with Jesus, but I'll be honest with you, Brandon, my relationships are, have hit rock bottom. Man, my relationships couldn't be worse. My friends have, have that's all kind of, I, I don't even really, couldn't even tell you if I have a close friend. My spouse, all of it's going, all of it's just going down and I just want God to restore those things. I want my relationships to be stronger than ever and I just want you to pray for me this morning. If that's you, just slip your hands up where you are. Come on, I see them all over this house. Hands up going everywhere, struggling relationships. For those of you that raise your hand, for those of you making commitments to Christ, I'm just gonna pray with you. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. It's not about this prayer, it's about your heart. It's about a commitment to who Jesus is for you. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for forgiveness. I commit from this day forward to give my life to you. I know that you died for my sins and I give them to you. And I'll leave here today different with a clean slate, living my life on purpose for you. Thank you, Father, for salvation in Jesus' name. Amen.